Hello, everyone. I see folks are joining, so we'll give you a few minutes just to uh, get into our webcast today. Welcome, welcome. I hope everyone is having a great Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday. I can't keep track anymore. Welcome, everyone. My name is Katie Nichols. I'm a SANS instructor, also a director of intelligence at Red Canary. I'm going to be your host today for our uh, SANS threat analysis rundown, our monthly star webcast. And I'll be joined, you can see them on video, by Robert and Alexi from ESET. Our topic for today is going to be diving into behind the scenes, right? Robert and Lexi have been involved in some major takedown operations with law enforcement, talking about that public-private cooperation. So that is our deep dive topic for the day. Let's dive right in. First things first, this is being recorded and the slides will be available. Those will be available on the page where you registered. Uh, within a couple of days, we will share those. So. Those are always the top questions. Yes, it's being recorded. Yes, we will share the slides so you can share this with your friends later. I know it's been kind of a busy week. If this is your first time joining the STAR webcast. Here's kind of our goal, trying to bring you the inside scoop on what's happening with regards to cyber threats. You now, some months we've done a deep dive into specific groups or malware families. Sometimes we take a look at how we operate as an industry, as a community. So lots of different voices. So excited to have Robert and Alexi join me today. Way we're going to structure things, we'll give a quick rundown of just a few things happening this week, and then I'll pass it over to Robert and Alexi for our deep dive, and then wrap up, send you off with some action items. Probably not a shock that the big thing in the news this week has been the uh, global supply chain compromise of solar winds, um, and lots of folks have talked about this, so I don't want to reiterate, you know, what others have said, but just a few things to emphasize this week. First off. It's interesting because as you know, a lot of you are analysts, Intel analysts, we talk about relying only on trusted sources, but I've seen when things like this happen that are really concerning, um, people start to trust any little thing they see. So what I'm telling myself and my team is, right, trust things that come out from governments, from Microsoft, from FireEye, great blog posts from Bolexity that I'd recommend you check out about this. Sands, uh, Jake Williams did a great webinar. There's a blog post up about that. So rely on trusted sources. And if you see something, or one random person tweeted, um, maybe look into it. But if one person on the internet said something, that's not usually a reliable source. So remember to trust those sources as you're trying to get information about this compromise. Next important point. If you've uh, heard me talk about group naming or attribution before, there's a lot of speculation, um, a lot of unsourced information and in news reports that uh, the Russian government is behind this breach. Um, I think it's really significant that FireEye, who is the company that named APT29, is calling this an uncategorized threat. That piece of information should be significant and tell us that FireEye, who named APT29, isn't confident enough in the attribution to a country or any uh, specific intelligence service. And what I would say is, unless you have a specific need to know the country behind this, I would put that out of your minds, right? Some of you, if you work for governments, if you're working with law enforcement, as Robert and Alexi are gonna talk about, maybe you care about that. But honestly, for this compromise, focus on your security and focus less on the attribution behind it. I know it's interesting, but I would put that out of your mind because there's a lot of other work to do. The other thing I would say, um, if I were a ransomware operator, for example, I would probably be drooling right now uh, there are still a lot of other threats out there. And so take this seriously, right? This is a global supply chain compromise, pretty serious thing, but don't ignore everything else that's happening on your networks because other adversaries might be taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, last thing I would say, I know it's been a busy week for everyone, myself as well. It started Sunday night, which was really fun. I'm sure Alexi and Robert woke up to it Monday morning. Um, this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Like new information is coming out all the time. And so just take it all with a grain of salt. Remember that, you know, this is going to be a marathon, new information coming out all the time. So please take care of yourselves. All right. So with that, let's move on from solar winds because there's a lot else happening in the world. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Robert and Lexi to deep dive into this topic of law enforcement cooperation. So go ahead and take over here. Um, really excited to have them both here. Um, they have a lot of expertise. I first met Robert, I think, at a TACCON uh, two years ago. 
when he spoke and I'm excited to hear their insights today. I can see your slides, so take it away. Finding the unmute button. It's always fun because when you present, it goes away. Yes. Okay. Now there you now go. You hear me, right? Perfect. Yep, we hear you. Okay. So it's a pleasure being here. Um, and yeah, let's get right to it because we have a lot of interesting uh, things to cover. And I totally agree with what you were saying that there are so many different types of threats out there. And that's uh, kind of what we were going for in this presentation because um, I think many of the people in the audience uh, had a chance to hear us talk at various conferences. And the, the topics that we typically discuss and typically talk about are, are APTs, um, whether that's uh, Fancy Bear or Sandworm or, or a bunch of the other APT groups. So, so this is one area of our focus, the focus of our research, but it's also not the only area of our research. So um, the, some of the other areas are, for example, vulnerability research. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on crimeware. So the other major big area, not just you know, state-sponsored APT attacks, uh, but also you know, financially motivated uh, crimeware, which is, which is probably, in, in terms of volume, it, it's, it's a bigger threat to most of the internet users out there than you know, the sophisticated stuff that uh, we security professionals like uh, reading, writing about, and, and, and researching as well. But um, the financially motivated thing is just you know, the thing that regular person needs to concern themselves with the most. So that's going to be our focus. Uh, this is a pretty fresh presentation. We put this stuff together and it, and it basically takes us through uh, some very interesting experiences that we had uh, with cooperating with law enforcement. So let's get right to it. Um, my name is Robert Lipovsky. Uh, I'm a senior malware researcher for ESET and I lead the research team at ESET, ESET's headquarters in uh, Bratislava. And as I said already, so our focus of the team is quite broad. Uh, cybercrime, which we'll be discussing today, uh, but also APT tracking, threat hunting, um, but also vulnerability research. And Alexi? And uh, yes, my name is Alexi. Uh, I have a similar role uh, as Robert. I'm based in Montreal and I lead the team of uh, malware researchers uh, here looking at uh, different, uh, different threats. Okay. So, these are the types, types of headlines we all like reading, right? But how do these botnet takedowns or cyber criminals arrest, how were they achieved? So that's what we're going to discuss today. We're going to discuss the role that a, a private cybersecurity company, such as ESET, can play in it. Um, and the very nature of cybercrime, more often than not, involves many different jurisdictions and victims, cyber criminals, and the malicious infrastructure that they're using, these are rarely all located in the same country. So it's very common for multiple law enforcement agencies to cooperate on a single case. And on some occasions, and for various reasons, uh, private industry partners, cybersecurity companies are brought into uh, these investigations. And we're gonna uh, cover the cases that we've been involved over the past couple of years, not, not all of them, of course, but uh, the most noteworthy examples. So what are the ways that a private cybersecurity company can contribute to, to a law enforcement investigation? Well, um, one is infrastructure mapping. So we provide support in mapping the malicious infrastructure of cybercrime activities, and we can do it at a, in a scalable way. So what does that mean exactly? Well, imagine you're investigating a botnet and your goal is to disrupt it, or say you're more ambitious and you wanna take it down completely. So what do you need to do? Well, first you need to map the infrastructure supporting the botnet and then take it all down at the same time. I mean, you can think of it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a cliche that cybersecurity is a cat and mouse game with, this, with the cyber criminals, and with botnets, it's also a game of whack-a-mole. Like if you take down uh, some, of the, some of the infrastructure, then other CNC servers pop up elsewhere. 
Um, and for example, for the, for the takedown and the disruption to be as effective and efficient as possible, you need to take down as large a chunk of the infrastructure at, uh, at, at a single time as possible. So, so this is really important. Um, now for some botnets, this is simple for, you know, when it's a really small one, you can do it by, you know, just running a few malware samples in, in a sandbox and extract the domain names, the IP addresses, and then take those down. Um, but in the cases that we'll be discussing today, uh, these are the cases that we've mostly been concerning ourselves with. Things are not that simple. So oftentimes, the malware you're targeting is in fact, it can be a kit. It can be a kit available for sale on the dark web. And it can be used by hundreds of different actors, each of those running their own botnets with their own command and control infrastructure. And discovering the whole infrastructure needs to be done at scale. And the only way to do that is to have access to as many samples, as many, many malware samples as possible and to automate that whole process. So this is something that we're going to talk about when we discuss the various examples. Um, and the second task that, that we are doing is performing in-depth threat analysis. And this serves to provide a detailed picture of a cyber criminal operation. And it can reveal crucial information such as the true purpose of an attack because that's very important. Um, and it can provide details on the monetization scheme or it can provide the identification of the victims, which is not always straightforward. So these are uh, the, the examples, the cases we'll be discussing today uh, that involved our cooperation with, uh, with law enforcement. And uh, here is a quick overview of, of the results of, of our infrastructure mapping and, and uh, the data that we were passing on uh, to law enforcement. So you can see that for uh, the Andromeda botnet, or also known as Gamaru or, or Wauchos, um, uh, there were a lot of samples that we analyzed and which also share the domains and the IP addresses. Uh, for TrickBot, a more recent example, uh, there were 125,000 samples uh, that were tracked by our systems, uh, over 3,500 domains in IP addresses. and. And we uncovered, we, we part, we extracted over 40,000 configuration files. So this, this was all uh, data that was very valuable uh, for, for the effort. But we'll get more into the details uh, later. Uh, and the third example that we'll be discussing is called Operation Windigo. And in this case, uh, the tracking was done quite differently. Uh, most of it was done manually. And the result of this tracking was that we uncovered tens of thousands of infected Linux servers, some of which were used to send out spam. So these were tens of millions of spam messages being sent out on a daily basis. Uh, others of the other, other, other servers were used to uh, redirect hundreds of thousands of uh, legitimate HTTP requests um, from visitors to unwanted content unwanted uh, web content and all of this, this is data for, for a single day. So very extensive operation and, and a, very in, a very interesting investigation. And Alexi will, will share really interesting uh, things on that one. So uh, let's take a closer look how these results are actually achieved. So how this tracking works. Um, as I said, it's important to have a lot of samples. And every day we receive suspicious files from various sources. Uh, Virus Total is one. Uh, Threat Exchange Partners is another source. Uh, but in terms of volume, the major source is from our own customers themselves uh, when they share telemetry data with us and suspicious files. Now, if you had to guess how many new, unique, malicious files come in, in, on our, into our lab on a daily basis? So on an average day, that number is over 30, uh, 350,000 unique malicious files. So obviously, all of this cannot be processed manually, uh, and automation is required. Um, and the first step is running these samples through a series of automated systems. You can think of them uh, as custom sandboxes, each of them built with 
specific features in order to get as much information as possible from these samples. And then afterwards, if detection is needed for that incoming sample, it will be added whether automatically or with human oversight. So this is the standard workflow for all of the samples that are coming in. But for malware samples that belong to a botnet, so for some that we identify that are part of a botnet, uh, we extended that pipeline for purposes that go beyond just detection. So here, this is uh, an automated botnet tracking system uh, that we put together. And it allows us to extract very exhaustive intelligence on those samples, including real-time data related to, command and to the command and control infrastructure. So these samples, they're, they're running in a controlled environment, but uh, in this case, it's more than just a sandbox because you're not just running uh, the samples that we acquired, but quite often we are actually doing our own re-implementation uh, of, uh, for example, the command and control protocol. So basically we are uh, programming and we are making the, the CNC believe that it's talking to an actual bot, whereas we are monitoring the actions. And uh, we are using unpackers and decryptors that we've written specifically uh, for those most prevalent botnets that we're tracking and extracting the relevant information from those. And of course, uh, the exit points at various geographic locations are used because some botnets or even individual campaigns of the botnets uh, sometimes only target specific countries. Uh, so this system, uh, it needs to be, it always needs to be up to speed with uh, the current communication protocol of the botnets that we're tracking. And if it changes, this is something that we are monitoring uh, continuously. And if it changes, then the emulator, the parser is updated. So what are the artifacts that are, that are extracted from this processing? So I hinted at it before when I showed you the statistics. Um, so one is samples. I mean, we have samples coming in, but this is also one of the ways of acquiring new samples when we are, we'll be probing uh, the CNC server asking for, for an update, for example. So this gives us a chance of getting a new version uh, of a particular uh, banking Trojan, for example, even before uh, other users uh, have a chance to get it and get infected by that so, so we can get our hands on that. Um, so this serves for detection mostly, but also it serves for analyzing how the malware is evolving. So this is also really important to, uh, to stay ahead of the game. And we can see what new techniques are being used and, and added and, and, and implemented. Um, the other artifact is the CNC servers. So the domains, the IP addresses, and these, of course, they continuously uh, keep on being updated as well. Um, and again, this, the benefits for this are twofold. One is for protecting our users because uh, the communication uh, with malicious CNC servers is blocked uh, for users uh, of, of our security software, but also this information on the CNC servers, that's something that we can and that we have been sharing with law enforcement for takedowns. And this is one of the most interesting pieces of information. Uh, that a cybersecurity company can provide. Then it's the configuration files. So basically you have, you have samples, these samples are talking to con uh, configuration servers and quite often uh, with banking Trojans, uh, they're basically like, like, like a skeleton. So it has some functionality, but it, it relies on configuration files uh, on configs telling them what to do, what to target and so on. So the, these configs are something that we are also tracking and something that we are parsing, extracting, and then, and then uh, using this as well. Uh, within those configurations, uh, we will often find the targets, uh, quite often found in web injects. So this particularly applies to the banking Trojans. Um, and this allows us to provide some kind of like an early warning to banks, for example. Um, so again, we don't only protect the, our own users, but also the bank's clients. So we'll share that information with the banks and then the bank can take extra protective measures. And so we pass on the information that something, some campaign is about to happen just as the perpetrators begin that campaign. So just as they add the target uh, to the web injects, to the configs, 
And ideally, the bank will take action also on their behalf before the campaign actually really sets off. So that's kind of the theoretical uh, rundown of, of how this works. Um, but enough of theory, and let's let's get to the examples, which I think are are really really interesting. So, Alexi, on to you. Yep, give me a moment to start that screen sharing. All right, that should be working. Yep. Excellent. So, um. One of our first really successful case of cooperation with law enforcement that used our botnet tracker system was four or five years ago. Um, and at that time, of course, the system was uh, in its early days, uh, much more uh, basic than it is right now. But still, uh, it allowed us to join a group involving uh, multiple partners, uh, Europol, the FBI, DOJ, uh, and other private industry partners. And the goal was to disrupt the Andromeda ecosystem. Uh, so before I talk about the actual disruption efforts, uh, let's talk about Andromeda for a second. So first, uh, the Europol press release was inaccurate. There never was only one Andromeda botnet, so um, let's fix that headline right away. There was actually many distinct botnets. Like Robert mentioned before, uh, some uh, malware families are sold as kits, and it was a case for Andromeda. Actually, an, an early version of the Andromeda malware was uh, like the builder was even leaked. So um, overall, it was really easy to obtain uh, a copy of, of, of the malware, easy to deploy. It was extensible and affordable. So very popular. Um, at the peak of its activity, uh, our telemetry showed Andromeda detections pretty much all over the world. Uh, although four specific countries were much less affected than others. And that was Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. And the reason for that is that the malware had code to uh, look at the system's keyboard when it first executed on, on a system. And it did not proceed with the infection if the keyboard uh, layout corresponded to uh, ones used in any of those four countries. That in itself is it's quite common to see that in malware to uh, avoid executing in, in different uh, countries. But at that time, we had no idea how much this small detail would have a huge impact on the conclusion of the operation, which you'll see why in just a few minutes. Now, Andromeda had several core features, which could be augmented with uh, optional plugins. But essentially, uh, Andromeda was uh, built for credential stealing, downloading additional malware, and performing uh, key logging. The spreading mechanisms used to deploy Andromeda, of course, varied from one cyber criminal to another, depending on their own preferred strategies. Uh, we saw um, um, operators using social media, instant messaging, removable drives, uh, typical spam campaigns, and even uh, uh, exploit kits. And in a similar way, the end goal of each operator varied. Uh, but what we saw, uh, we actually saw a large proportion of Andromeda based botnets just being used to deploy additional malware, effectively uh, running a paper install service. Now back to the disruption effort. So before law enforcement action could even begin, we had to do one thing. It was to build the most comprehensive list of all the network infrastructure infrastructure used to control all the Andromeda botnets. And, and that list needed to be accurate, uh, up to date, and also to be curated to exclude friendly hosts. So we did not want to uh, disrupt, for example, a sinkhole server run by uh, fellow security researchers, for example. And so we implemented the Andromeda specific code in uh, botnet tracker. And for months, uh, we processed all the new incoming uh, Andromeda variants that, uh, uh, that we could get our hands on extracting the C2 configuration and building that, that master list, which we shared with a working group. And our list was merged with uh, similar intelligence coming from the other partners uh, to make one huge, uh, very complete list. And now on disruption day, that list included uh, 1,200, just over 1,200 domain names and IP addresses. Um, and uh, these were used to control 
almost 500 distinct Andromeda-based botnets. So with the disruption, uh, the working group gained control of a significant portion of those 1,200 um, uh, IP addresses. And the traffic actually got redirected to uh, our own sinkhole, causing first uh, the botnet operators to completely lose control over their infected machines. But also that sinkhole allowed us to, uh, to get access to very valuable information on victims. Uh, for one thing, it allowed us to start a notification and remediation effort, um, and ultimately, uh, over 1 million in, uh, machines connected to the sinkhole. So that's quite a lot of infected machines out there. And so after that specific day, as far as we were concerned, the operation was a success. We actually saw an immediate and very sharp decline in Andromeda-related detections uh, among our customers. And actually, to our surprise, a few days later, we learned that the alleged author of the malware got arrested. And we were actually not aware that this was going on at the same time as we were uh, working on the disruption part of the operation. And that news came as a pleasant surprise because uh, we believe that disrupting botnet infrastructure does have an impact on the, saf the safety of internet users. But of course, bringing malware authors and operators to justice has the potential to have a much longer term impact. And so we just sat back and followed that story like everybody else. Uh, so the suspect uh, named Sergei Yaretz uh, spent six months in jail uh, uh, until his trial started in uh, Belarus. Now I mentioned that uh, at the very least a million computers were infected by Andromeda. But you also remember that the malware would not infect computers with the keyboard layouts corresponding to four countries, including Belarus. Well, the judge during the trial actually said that he was impressed by the fact that the malware had those built-in measures to avoid infecting computers in Belarus and other CIS countries. And he actually offered Yaretz a deal Charges would be dropped if he cooperated with the investigators um, and if he uh, remitted all the profits he made by the sale of the malware to uh, other cyber criminals, which was established, I don't know how, but to a grand total of 5,000 US dollars. And so obviously, Yaretz took the deal and sent this tweet upon his release, which is Russian for I'm free. So that was a Belarusian judge, right? Yes, absolutely. And so if we sum up that case, um, so the cooperation between multiple partners uh, allowed us really to gather the exhaustive list of the uh, Andromeda sovereign infrastructure and to take down a really significant portion of, of that infra uh, in just one shot. And we removed uh, over a million infected hosts from harm's way. And as a bonus, uh, the malware author was identified and brought to justice. Of course, even though well, something that uh, Yaretz did not get the sentence he deserved, uh, but that's a topic for another discussion. Robert, your turn now. Okay. So, yes, Andromeda was a very interesting case. So, but now moving on to the second example, uh, this one. Again, very interesting, and, and this is a more recent one. Again, this was a joint operation. Uh, we teamed up with uh, Microsoft and, and the other industry partners and actually play, played a similar role as with the Andromeda case. So we shared intelligence on the infrastructure supporting uh, this malware family, uh, which needs no introduction. So we're talking about TrickBot. And in this part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about the malware. Um, I, I know many of you are familiar with it, so I'll just do a quick recap, or maybe I'll mention something that, that um, some of you may not have realized um, or, or forgot. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the tracking of their infrastructure that we were doing. I showed the numbers already. Uh, so just to recap, just in 2020, uh, our botnet tracking system analyzed over 125,000 uh, TrickBot samples. And from those, um, 
decrypted more than 40,000 configuration files uh, used by the different trick vault modules. And, and you'll hear more about the complications of the trick bots uh, configs in just a second. So now TrickBot, it's, it's been a nuisance for um, internet users for a really long time. Um, our first detection for TrickBot was uh, created in late 2016. And during these years, TrickBot compromises were reported in a steady manner, making it one of the largest and longest lived botnets out there. Here you can see uh, data from our telemetry and you can see that TrickBot it has been a global threat. In fact, uh, we've observed detections in most countries of the world. Um, how did it spread is the obvious question. Uh, well, again, throughout its existence, um, TrickBot was distributed in a number of ways. Uh, one of the mo more notable ones um, and more recent ones uh, is an execution chain that we, we've seen frequently with TrickBot. Um, it's been dropped on systems that were already compromised by Emotet, another large infamous botnet. So, so this is a really good example of cooperation between various uh, cyber criminals, various cyber criminal en enterprises, you know, for them acting as business partners. Uh, another thing that we need to uh, we need to discuss: What does Trickbot do? Well, in the past, uh, Trickbot was mostly used as a banking trojan. So that means stealing credentials from online bank accounts and then abusing those to try to perform fraudulent transfers. Um, but TrickBot's modular architecture actually allows it to perform a variety of malicious actions using a variety of, of its plugins. So it can steal all kinds of credentials, uh, not only limited to online banking, uh, from the compromised computer. And more recently, uh, it's been observed that it was, again, acting as a delivery mechanism for other malware for more damaging attacks, such as ransomware. So, but let's go back to, to the banking Trojan capability and, and uh, WebInjex. So this was facilitated by uh, one of the oldest plugins that were developed for the TrickVault platform. Um, so WebInjex, they allow malware to dynamically change what the user of a compromised uh, system sees when they visit specific websites. And it's not just the visible things, but it's the HTML basically, or, or the, the script or whatever is loaded in the web page. So even the things that you don't see, or, or you can basically change the functionality of, of uh, the web page. And uh, to operate this plugin, this web inject plugin relies on configuration files um, downloaded by the main module of TrickBot. And the, they contain information about which websites should be modified and how. So here's uh, an extraction of one such decrypted config containing the targeted URLs and the malicious CNC URLs that the botched contact after the victim accesses the targeted URLs. So through our monitoring of uh, TrickBot campaigns, we collected tens of thousands of different configs, allowing us to know which websites were targeted by the operators. Uh, here in this graph, uh, you can see the number of websites extracted from the configs in 2020. And the targeted URLs uh, mostly belonged to financial institutions. Notice that there is a sharp drop in uh, the number of targets found in these configuration files starting in March. Uh, this coincides with the moment when TrickBot operators dropped the WebInject module from the list of default plugins automatically downloaded by the main module. So this is why we have actually no data in March and we had to adjust our processes to maintain visibility on the targeted URLs. And this drop in number is likely due to TrickBot starting to focus on another means of monetization during that time frame, which I already mentioned ransomware. So in these ransomware cases, uh, a TrickBot compromise uh, would first be leveraged to perform a reconnaissance and then lateral movement in an organization's network. So acting you know, like we're used to with APTs basically, 
and then the, drop the Ryuk ransomware on as many systems as possible. So this is this is the large difference. So it's not a you know a highly targeted attack, but it's a mass spreading one. Um, Ryuk, I think, again, needs no introduction. And in fact, it's been a topic of the Star webcast already. So if you haven't seen that one, then uh, go back and watch that, that past episode. Um, from the data we collected, it appears that TrickBot's operators move from attempting to steal money from bank accounts to compromising a whole organization with TrickBot and then using it to execute Ryuk and demand a ransom to unlock the affected systems. So uh, not, 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 not really a, an uncommon change of uh, modus operandi for cyber criminals. Now let's talk more about Trick boss configuration files. Uh, they're on multiple levels. Uh, so you kind of have a, have a uh, scene from inception. Uh, the main module of TrickBot contains an encrypted hard, config, uh, hard coded uh, configuration. This contains a list of CNC servers, as well as the default list of plugins that should be downloaded. Now, some of these plugins, they also use their own configuration files. And these plugins, they rely on the main module to download these secondary configuration files from the CNC servers. And the plugins achieve this by passing a small, so-called what we call module configuration structure, uh, which we had to extract from the plugin binaries overlay section. So this lets the main module know what it should download. Again, uh, the main module uses its hard-coded CNC servers and connects to one of them to download a second list of CNC servers. It contacts this second layer of CNCs to download the default plugins specified in the hard-coded config. And then, it's not over, <laughs> and then other modules can be downloaded later upon receiving a command to do so uh, from the TrickBot operators on demand. So if all of that sounds a bit confusing, it is a bit confusing. Um, and being able to gather all these configuration files allowed us to map the network infrastructure of, of TrickBot. All these different layers were what made the effort all the more challenging. Now, we discussed the configs as for command and control servers. Uh, we've also been tracking these uh, since early 2017. And this, of course, uh, was also vital in the whole disruption effort. And another interesting artifact we were able to gather through crawling this botnet is this unique identifier present in each TrickBot sample, uh, so-called GTAG. Uh, it's a text string uh, found in the initial hard-coded configuration file, uh, and it identifies different TrickBot campaigns or modes of compromise. For example, the MOR, M -O -R, uh, campaigns uh, we believe to be trickbot compromises due to emotet. Or the GTAX can also sometimes indicate the target of a campaign. For example, the campaign with a GTAG UK03-1 targeted financial institutions in the United Kingdom. So here you can see a timeline of all GTAGs, uh, which we extracted from trickbot configs uh, from September 2019 to September 2020, just before passing this information uh, to the working group. Uh, also, if you look at the more group, MOR, uh, we can see the abrupt stop uh, of the Emotech campaigns in April 2020, which is quite well known. Um, so in summary, uh, tracking TrickBot is, or was, actually is, because we're still continuing this, um, it's no simple task, but it was worth it. Um, the operation was a success. 94% um, of the TrickBot infrastructure got taken down. So now on to Alexi. All right. Good. So, um, so uh, botnets, uh, like uh, based on Andromeda or, or TrickBot, um, it's relatively straightforward to, uh, they are really stra relatively straightforward to, to track. 
um, because we have lots of samples. We can process them automatically and uh, and see what they what they're actually doing. But in some cases, we stumble upon samples that we know for sure are malicious, but for which we don't have uh, a lot of, of, of copy of or, or variants of. Sometimes we just have one or two uh, different files to analyze, and it's really hard to track them. And sometimes we don't even know what the purpose, what, what the purpose of, of the malware is. And so in these cases, we need to perform in-depth analysis. And this is uh, quite time consuming because it has to be done manually. It always involves reverse engineering, uh, but also analysis of communication protocols, uh, crypto algorithms, uh, even uh, deploying custom made honeypots um, to get a, a better grip of, of what's going on. So it's really time consuming, but sometimes it, it really pays off because it, this allows us to expose some fairly complex operations that would have otherwise stayed under the radar, uh, maybe for, for years. So to explain what, that, what that, that really means, let me tell you about uh, a case we worked with the FBI that eventually led to the arrest and conviction of a Russian co-conspirator. Um, okay, so Operation Windigo is a, a name we gave to a very large scale malicious operation that we first discovered in 2013. It's still one of the largest investigation we ever uh, performed at ESET. Uh, near the end of it, uh, about half a dozen malware researchers were working on that uh, full time. And it actually started when we analyzed a pretty complex Linux OpenSSH backdoor, followed by uh, the discovery of a pretty interesting malicious Apache module. And eventually, we found a connection between the two. And that's when everything unraveled. And uh, a, a small parenthesis, uh, we're always particularly interested in analyzing non-Windows malware. Uh, these are less common. Um, they use different techniques than the, the ones we're used to, to seeing. And uh, we always get to read messages from angry Apple or, or Linux fans arguing that their favorite uh, operating system is secure and that the malware we just documented is not relevant at all because it didn't exploit any OS vulnerability. So that part is always entertaining, that's for sure. So anyway, this is the schema of the whole operation. Um, in total, there were about half a dozen distinct server-side Linux malware families involved. We confirmed tens of thousands of servers infected by one or more of these malware, including servers belonging to cPanel and to the Linux kernel organization. So in a nutshell, Operation Windigo relied on three main uh, malware families, each with, uh, with uh, specific objectives. First, there was Ibery. That was the core component of everything. It was the uh, SSH backdoor with a, a credential stealer component. Then we had CDORC, uh, which was a malicious HTTP backdoor that was actually portable to Apache, Nginx, and Lite HTTPD that was used to redirect visitors to uh, exploit kits, online ads, and in some cases to adult content. And then we had CalfBot, which was a spam sending component written in Perl. So I'm really telling you this was the most complex malicious infrastructure we ever saw. It took us literally months to put the pieces together. And halfway through the investigation, we were still not really sure what was going on in there, what, what the actual purpose of this scheme was. But eventually we understood enough uh, and we published a white paper. Uh, and shortly after that, the FBI out of the blue reached out to us asking for additional details and um, for some assistance in their own investigation. And as you'll see, this, this cooperation was really different uh, from what we did in the cases of Andromeda and TrickBot. So of course, our investigation gave us a, a, a good overview of the malicious infrastructure supporting the, the operation. And uh, this is uh, something that was useful. But in Operation Windigo, most of the malicious infrastructure was actually hosted on the victims themselves. So our list of nodes, malicious nodes, was also a list of real victims. And that actually was really useful because for law enforcement to open an, uh, an investigation, they need to find a victim that's in the right jurisdiction and that's also willing to press charges. 
Um, and on our side, we were actually able to contact some of those victims uh, to ask for, uh, for technical assistance to understand better what was going on with their servers. Some victims never bothered to answer us or even to clean up their infected servers, but some were much more cooperative. We even got root access on a few servers just by asking nicely. And uh, something worth mentioning is that uh, Iberi was designed to exfiltrate the stolen credentials to specific exfiltration servers to which the attackers would later connect to and just fetch the data. Now, those servers were also running off of compromised hosts. And believe it or not, for about five days, we were root on one of those nodes. And so we could see in real time the stolen credentials come in. So not only did we have a list of current victims, we also had a list of future ones whose credentials just got compromised. And overall, in those five days, we saw about 5,000 unique valid credentials. About 40 of these were for the root, uh, the root username. So just in five days. And imagine the Windigo operation went on for years. Um, and so, of course, that is also in information that we shared with, uh, with the FBI to fuel their investigation. But we still had one question to answer. What was the actual purpose of the attack besides you know, just stealing SSH credentials and infecting more servers to steal more credentials and so forth? So answering that question is always crucial in, in, in an investigation. So for one thing, it allows to establish the extent of the damages sustained by the victims, but it can also point to a money trail that law enforcement might be able to follow and eventually find the true identity of the people behind the attack, those actually getting the money out of, of the operation. And that's when our in-depth analysis of CDORK and CALFBOT became useful. So let's start with CDORK, which was deployed on infected web servers to redirect visitors to unwanted content. The most common redirection was uh, to send the visitors to an exploit kit that attempted to drop one of, the, one of two Windows malware. There was Boax, which is a specialized uh, malware uh, doing ad fraud, and Bluptaba, a generic proxy. Um, just for reference, the, the, the first exploit kit used was Black Hole, and it was followed by a a Neutrino shortly after the Black Hole alleged author was arrested. Um, and we, uh, we observed about 1% of, uh, of the visitors being redirected to the exploit kit getting successfully infected and uh, by one of those two Windows malware. And uh, most of the remaining uh, visitors just got redirected to online ads. And now CalfBot, which, is, uh, which was deployed mostly on infected mail servers, was of course used to send spam. And what we did is we wrote a custom bot that emulated the uh, communication protocol and Doing that, we were able to, to acquire spam jobs directly from the C2s and automate the monitoring of what we were told to, uh, to push. And our analysis of the CDORC redirections to uh, ad networks combined with the URLs included in the spam sent by CalfBot, we confirmed that the operators were making money off of their botnet through affiliate programs, mostly uh, for online gambling, dating websites, and adult content. So in other words, legitimate websites were paying the Windigo operators for every visitor they drove to those websites. Of course, they never knew that that traffic was fraudulent and totally worthless. And uh, as Robert mentioned, so CalfBot at some point was sending tens of millions of spam every day. And we were able to monitor all this um, uh, CDORT redirections, and that reached half a million of web queries per day at a certain point during our investigation. And so what we did is we aggregated all those affiliate links coming from all these, these sources and shared that with the FBI, who followed the money trail, because real money was paid by real businesses for this traffic. So eventually, that money needed to be extracted and deposited in, in bank accounts. And so after that phase, things went really quiet. We didn't hear back uh, uh, for several months until we learned in the news that Maxim Senak, a Russian citizen, was formally identified as a co-conspirator behind Operation Windigo 
and that he got indicted by the US and actually arrested in Finland. So I wanna pause here and just take a moment to emphasize this. People often hear that going after cyber criminals is a waste of time because they live in countries where they are untouchable. And in fact, it's true that many countries are relatively safe for cyber criminal to live in. But regardless, getting an, an indictment is a life altering event. It means that for the person targeted, visiting a certain number of countries will lead to at least a temporary arrest, questioning and running the risk of getting extradited. And this is exactly what happened in this case. So uh, Senak traveled to Finland to visit a relative and the indictment happened while he was still traveling. So when he was about to leave Finland to go back to Russia, that's when the Finnish authorities were able to arrest him. And eventually the US filed an extradition request to the uh, Finnish government who agreed to it. So Senek was given a one-way uh, ticket to the US to face justice. And he rapidly pleaded non-guilty. And this is when we were brought back in this case because a non-guilty plea meant that there would be a trial and the US prosecutors needed an expert witness to explain the court everything about Operation Windigo. And naturally they asked us to be that expert witness and to testify in open court. Now, remember that big diagram from before with all the components of, of Operation Windigo? Well, it was hard enough to explain that to other malware researchers. Now imagine the task to explain that to a team of lawyers and prosecutors and eventually to a judge who are not familiar with the computer science at all. And so we flew our main researcher to Minneapolis for a full two day briefing with the team in charge of the prosecution going page after page of our 69 page long white paper uh, explaining the basics such as what an IP address is and uh, what is the purpose of the SSH protocol and slowly moving up to how the operation was structured and monetized. And that's important because just doing malware research is it's really technical work, of course, uh, and it's necessary to do those those investigations. But we have to understand that it comes with a certain responsibility to be able to explain the findings to law enforcement in a way they can understand and eventually to lawyers and, and a judge for, for all those investigations to, to, have, to have an effect. But in this case though, we ended up not having to testify because Senac decided to plead guilty to a reduced set of charges, which meant no trial would be necessary. And in the end, he got sentenced to 46 months in a federal US prison. And so um, just a few closing remarks. Uh, investing cybercrime, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, this is not new information, it's complex. It requires lots of different expertise uh, to come in together. Uh, and it's, it's pretty impossible to do in isolation. Um, so you saw what private sector can contribute to joint investigation, technical expertise, intelligence, raw data. Um, but it's important to mention what law enforcement brings to the table. Uh, law enforcement has, of course, police powers. They can get warrants to obtain information that would that is absolutely out of reach uh, for private companies. Imagine net flow data, uh, um, disk images, things like that. And law enforcement has um, police expertise, for example, to follow money trail and eventually identify suspects and bring them to justice. So when you think about it, Law enforcement and private sector working together just makes so much sense. In the end, we all have the same objective, which is to stop cybercrime. And uh, one last thing about uh, trust. Um, trust is at, at the core and center of, of cybersecurity. Uh, you probably all know it. Um, and when private industry works with law enforcement partners, trust is even more important. Um, from the private sector, we have to trust that law enforcement will actually use and take action on the information that we put together and share. Otherwise, we would just be wasting our time, right? Um, we also need to trust that that information will not be shared to other parties who might uh, misuse it for their own benefit, for example. And on the other hand, law enforcement has to trust that the information coming from their private partners is thorough and 100% accurate. And the only way we found so far 
to reach that a, a, a good or the maximum level of trust is to start in, in small cooperation and to build up as time goes and to at every step of the way all the time to act fairly and ethically with all the partners involved. So thank you for your attention and we have a few minutes for question hopefully. Yeah, we have just a couple minutes. Thank you so much. I love ending on that note. And I mean, I think that's what we've all found in this community is right. The only way that we're going to succeed is by cooperating, but building that trust is absolutely key. Um, and I agree with you. I think it happens over time. Um, so a couple of questions. If anyone else has questions, you can throw those in the Q&A panel. Um, one that came in and that I'm kind of curious as well about thinking about all of the different jurisdictions that you mentioned, you know, global law enforcement, public private companies. Um, could you talk a little bit about, about how you deconflict? Is that something that you as private researchers do? Do you kind of push things one way? How do you deconflict given all of these different jurisdictions? Maybe I can try and answer that. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a fundamentally hard problem. Sometimes even in 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 a single um, organization, it's hard to do. So imagine when several organizations are spread across the world, and it's actually not um, how to say it. It's it's uh, it's not something that that is easy to do from a private sector perspective, and we don't put too much energy into that. Um, mm -hmm. We, we kind of rely on law enforcement to have more insight on, on, on those on, on that aspect. So we kind of rely on, for example, the FBI to know if there's another federal investigation happening at the same time on the same topic. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because right, you as a private company, ideally if law enforcement is sort of the hub and then each of the private companies are spokes, like you'd hope that law enforcement's cooperating globally, which I think you've given evidence has, has happened in the past, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly add on that. Uh, I, I agree with what was said, that it's mostly the, the law enforcement agencies uh, making mm -hmm. sure that um, taking care of the jurisdictional aspect of, of, of things. And we often cooperate, for example, with the not local law enforcement agencies in every individual small country, but but uh, like cross-border organizations, you know, such as Europol, which are, you know, cross-border, so so like larger larger law enforcement organization, uh, organizations, which uh, which then, as, as was said, should be aware of, you know, the jurisdictional aspect of things. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, I think we are running short on time. Um, so I would say if anyone else has other questions, they can probably just do an at you said research, or I know you both are on Twitter. Um, so if anyone has questions, you know, there's one on the racing matrix. So feel free to just uh, tweet anyone if you have additional questions. So um, just to kind of give a few final thoughts as we wrap up, a couple action items. We always have some go-do things based on what Robert and Alexi have talked about, um, right? There were a lot of technical takeaways in there. I tweeted some things about even just looking at the process for bringing in malware samples, how do you automate some of that? How do you do manual research there? Think about how you could apply that or you know, some of the methodology that Robert and Alexi talked about in your own networks. How can you identify if you're part of a botnet? Another you know, takeaway as, um, as we were wrapping up, right? You gotta have these contacts to be able to participate in global takedowns like this. So. I would suggest, you know, if you don't already know someone in law enforcement, or if you're in law enforcement, you don't have private sector contacts, develop those contacts early. And I love the recommendation to start small. You now maybe start, hey, we saw this, you know, can we connect some people and then build from there where you can have a huge impact on these global takedown operations. Another thing I'd highlight is remember, right, as you know, Alexi and Robert have talked about, they only saw a piece of the puzzle, maybe thousands of victims, but other agencies, other partners might see more. So think about that and how by working together, we can all kind of piece together what we're seeing. And as I think we've seen today, have a huge impact on these uh, adversaries. Um, and last but not least, a lot to take in from today, a lot happening this week. Um, so I just say for everyone, regardless of what holiday you celebrate, please take some time, relax, take care of yourself. There's a lot happening in this, in this community. Um, but please take time to relax. And uh, we're in this for the long haul. So with that, a couple references. Uh, again, these slides will be available on the page where you registered 
along with the recording. So if you'd like to share this out um, with your colleagues, your friends, family, whoever, this will be available for the next couple of days. So keep an eye on the page where you registered for the recording. And with that, thank you, Robert, Alexi, so much for coming and sharing today. Take care, everyone. Be well, and we hope to see you at a future webcast. Thanks for having us. Stay safe. Mm -hmm.